and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the law, the events of the day, and the Constitution to you. We've been on a little bit because of COVID, but we're back. Mark, what are we covering tonight? Uh, good evening, Jen. Well, it's good to have the show going. We've had some uh, uh, little uh, adaptation to do because of the whole shutdown and one thing or another on the Zoom, but we're, uh, we're up and running. And uh, what we're going to start off with today is something that's fairly new, and it's called a subchapter five, a Roman numeral five bankruptcy. And it's a subset of a chapter 11, which is what a business does when it needs to reorganize for financial reasons. So we're going to do that for our first segment. And then in the second segment, we're going to talk about a Supreme Court case. But let's start right in about subchapter five. All right. Well, I understand uh, the chapter 11, just so you know, I just finished being on a committee for a large uh, tech company uh, as they reorganize under chapter 11. And I will tell you, a large company reorganizing under a chapter 11 is a complex organizational feat. So Mark, I can tell you this, after residing on a committee for nearly a year, I will tell you, a committee is a hindrance to a chapter 11. <laughs> well, so tell me why the chapter five is better. Well, it's a sub chapter five, but I say it depends on whose side you're on. If you're, maybe if you're a debtor, you like that committee, you know, because <laughs> the, committee, the committee can kind of uh, torpedo the, uh, the plan. So, um, or one guy on the committee can object and then you're, your, your plan doesn't go through. Well, you can do go to the cram down, but then you're going into a lot of litigation. <laughs> so what happens with the subchapter five, and it, it was, uh, Pat, uh, it started to be implemented on February 22nd and 2020. So it's fairly recent. And uh, it was, if you're, if you're doing less than $2.7 million worth of forgiveness or debt that you want to forgive, um, that, that was originally what it was. And then just in October, there was the CARES Act, and then they bumped that up to 7.5 million. So that, that only lasts till next March. So I would say if you're thinking of going bankrupt, you might consider doing it pretty dang soon. Hey, Mark, can you explain now why they only did it on a short term like that? I mean, why would they push it all into less than a year? Well, I think that the reason they up from the 2.7 to the 7.5 was because they, they, you know, because just kind of the emergency because of all the shutdowns. And I think it's like everything else. I mean, I, there's a lot of theories about the whole, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, COVID-19. But when they're telling people how long they're going to be shut down, they like to tell them it's going to be three weeks. What's well, going to be another month, another month. And I think if they said, well, we're extending this for 10 more years because of COVID-19, people would freak out. So you know, I, you know, there's kind of, they're letting this out in drips and drabs. Um, so that's my theory. I think it's kind of political. There's no real reason you wouldn't do it that way, but uh, who knows what's really going to happen. But also I think what the reason they were able to push it up from 2.7 to 7.5 was because of the emergency, right? Yeah. And the emergency can't, well, emergencies actually do go on forever, often when you pass a law. But, you know, they have to pretend they'll go away soon. No, they can't really. Well, it depends what the political winds are asking for, Mark. Yeah, right. We so, don't want to get too far into that. Why don't you tell me some more about the subchapter five and what are the benefits for the, for the small company? Because this is small company stuff. Uh, yeah, for going through a reorganization under that. Okay, so, you know, mainly I think right now what you're going to see is like a, a lot of restaurants and bars and they're really having, well, spas, you know, any place, you know, that has person to person contact, they're in a lot of trouble. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of them could make it for the first couple months. A lot of them are just, you know, whatever paying their triple net or they've worked out some deal with the landlord. They're getting some kind of reduction in the rent. But you got to understand even a small restaurant, say San Francisco is paying $20,000 a month in rent, maybe $30,000 a month. And if you're just doing takeout, depends on your structure, you know, but if you, I would say the places that were designed more for takeout are doing okay, right? Uh, but the places that were more like, we're going to be a sit down, people are going to buy some drinks and we're going to make our money on the drinks. These guys are in a lot of trouble. And so I think you see that that's, that's going to come to a certain point. Uh, where well, they're that, gonna okay, to, let me ask that then. 
um, is um, under the say say you had landlords and tenants doing deals of restaurants, which as restaurant tenants, is there going to be any restriction on whether or not any interim agreements they sign might be uh, enforceable even under a reorganization? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't really know the answer to that. And I think there's going to be a lot of that. But I think, I, I guess I, I guess the way I would look is kind of buyer beware. You know, people are going to keep the deal as long as they have to. And then when it's to their advantage to, uh, I mean, if they've got federal protection, any deal they made in a state court, you know, in, in a state contract is going to be superseded. So I think that the bankruptcy would supersede that. Um but I mean, you got to look at it from the landlord's point of view too. I mean, they've got someone in there, right? And even if they're only paying a percentage of the rent, it's better than having no one in there paying no rent. So, I mean, there's a balancing act that a judge would look at on that one too. Yeah, well, see, that's the whole thing because you know how they have the anti-eviction laws going on. Right. I'm not even sure what's really enforceable or not enforceable with those. I know the entire, every court system that I'm dealing with has been hindered dramatically because they've had a layoff staff. So the idea that a landlord can even get anything out of an uh, eviction is questionable. So then you throw in the chapter 11 or the sub chapter five in this case. Uh, I, I have this really ominous thought that a, land, a lot of landlords are gonna be taken to the bank because of the largesse of the government telling them they have to eat it. Well, that's in the big picture. I I just don't, you know, as far as the, you know, the, the macroeconomics of this, I think, you know, what you really are, we're in a struggle. I mean, if you look at the macro, I say we're in a struggle with China, but I, that's for a separate show. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not for this show. This show is for if you're a small business and you thought, okay, I can hang together for two months or three months, and you kind of made your business plan adjustment around that. Now we're at the eight or ninth month and you're going, uh oh, you know what am I going to do? I would say ch sub chapter five may be the way to go, because otherwise, you know, you your landlord at a certain point is going to lose his patience. Well, Mark, let me ask a question. Can't you take? Why don't you take us through like from the start and then walk us through how that process really looks? Okay. Well, okay. So let's say that you first of all you've got to you've got to describe what your business does and how they do it. And, you know, so you want to have, you know, so you got to describe your business. And the idea of that is like, if they're, if a, if the trustee is going to go, okay, I'm going to grant this chapter, step, chapter five, he wants to be sure that you're going to make your payments after the plan goes, gets in there. Right now, this is not as strict as a chapter 11 plan, you know, chapter 11 plan is, is got to be pretty much, you know, uh, pretty complex and pretty much saying this is how it's going to work. Um, the chapter five is a little more lenient, but still the basic principle is that you're supposed to make your obligations that you set on your plan. But not I 100 percent of your obligations, right? Well, no, no, but the, no, that are in so the plan. Back. The plan is going to cram down a lot of people. A lot of people are going to get stuck, right? They're going to be out of the money. But once you agree, I'm going to pay this dime on the dollar or 15 cents of the dollar, and I'm gonna pay these off, and this is how I'm gonna be profitable and pay my employees and move forward. That, that you have to explain that, right? So how are you gonna move forward after you get the relief, right? Because right. you don't wanna get the relief, and then six months later, you need the relief again, right? <laughs> yeah, just like- I mean, Well, there's still gonna be restrictions on, you file once, you're kind of stuck for so many years. Well, I know, but I mean, they don't, but they don't wanna see you going belly up because- right you had a over uh, uh, optimistic plan, okay? Right. And then if you, and, then, and if it looks like, you know, that plan isn't feasible, well then that, it's not a real plan, right? You're not gonna make it, so you're not gonna get approved. Well, you so, know, we have a wild card right now because we don't know how long COVID's going and how people are going to be able to meet the obligations of a plan. It's almost like we should wait till COVID's sort of over before you commit to how you're gonna pay back the, the various creditors under a plan. Well, COVID's going to be over in three months, three weeks, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that, what they told us in March, in March. of 2020. Yeah, March. <laughs> yeah, it was what they said in March. 
So yeah, I, that's kind of unknown, but you're at, I, what I'm trying to is, is, is kind of look at the difference between a subchapter five and 11. Okay, okay so I, tell us I, the next step. What's the next okay, step? Okay, so what, but one of the, the biggest chapter. difference is that in, a, in 11 is that if you're the owner of this business, you may no longer be the owner of the business as part of the plan. Subchapter five tries to keep the owner of business staying to be the owner of the business. Okay. okay. And then also as in any you know bankruptcy or any uh, uh, priorities, the priorities aren't as strict as under 11. In other words, you know, there, there's, you know, you have the least rights if you're insider and the most rights, you know, the furthest away of investors, that, that, uh, that ladder of priority is not as strict under the, the subchapter five, because you're talking about smaller businesses and there's more probably family and friends kind of thing there. So they're a little more uh, lenient on that. And that makes it so you don't file your chat. And one of the things they didn't like, and but what you were talking about, you can't do another one, but what if you do a chapter 11 and then you have to do a chapter seven? Oh, I mean, months. convert it to a seven because you're no way you can meet. The Not going to make it, right? And so what they're trying to do is like, instead of doing an 11 and being very harsh, and then he has to convert to a seven, let's try to make this sub chapter five looking that, yeah, it's not the perfect plan, but, it, you know, and maybe we'll have to give it more time and maybe it's kind of a bigger cram down, but he's going to survive. So I think okay, that's... So is this kind of, subchapter five then is trying to look out for the small business owners right. other than looking out just for the creditors? Well, I think the creditors are in, uh, you know, bad situation either way, particularly unsecured. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're unsecured, you got a real Good problem. Bye -bye. That's no okay. matter how it goes. Yeah. Um, if you're secured, I think that, yes, someone does 11, then they later do a seven, you've got a real problem. You're probably better off they do a subchapter five. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think that's, that the person that's where the belt is. Overly optimistic, but is actually predicting properly. Right. On so, their ability to repay. And also, I think what it's going is that they want to set it up so people aren't as resistant you know, because it's probably a good decision, business decision at a certain point to do a bankruptcy. And the chapter 11 kind of pushes people off because it's so complex. And well, going, chapter 11s, as you, you know and I know, are usually for people that have a lot of assets, they have a lot of debt, and so they're going to take the assets they have. It's not like a seven where you have very little assets, but you have a lot of debt. And there were 11, the, the one I was just working on, there was actually lot, uh, millions and millions and millions in incoming revenue, but their debt load was five times that. So yeah. you did have assets and it looked like even uh, completely unsecured creditors were gonna get a little piece of the pie. And what's interesting about that is that's why the 11 reorganization is a commitment by the, the debtor to make, make somebody partially whole that originally uh, that had extended a large amount of credit, but you're not just wiping them out like a chapter seven. Right. Now the subchapter five still looking out for you, but I, I can see that it's, it's such a hybrid between the seven and the 11. Does that make sense in that? I... Well, what I think what I what I think they see is there's a lot more bankruptcies coming as a result of the shutdowns, and they're hiring quite a few more trustees. I think 50 more trustees or quite a few more. So they're saying there's going to be a flood of bankruptcies, and so let's make them so we can manage them. I think that's okay. what this is about. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, all right, so what I'm thinking is, is that uh, do you believe that overall it looking pretty good? That uh, subchapter five is actually a good method to handle the unique situation we have today? Well, I think if you're a small business and you are, um, I, and I, do, I don't know if I can give you a, a, a percentage, but let's say you're bringing in 30, 40, 50% of the revenue were last March. And, you know, you know, maybe that's, I, I'm not sure what that percentage is where you draw that line where say, now, if you're bringing in 10 or 20%, you might even not even qualify for the subchapter five. Yeah, so there's okay. a sweet there, spot. Is there, because you're 
you're over 7.5? Well, over no, not so much you're over 7.5, but there's no way you're going to be able to make a plan pay off in the future. You're yeah, just right. business so model not going to work. to go to the Chapter 7. Yeah. So okay, I'm just well, saying, listen, I think this is a complicated subject, and I think what we have to do is I think we're going to have to watch and how these play out a little bit, but I'd like to move on to our next subject. And which one is that, Mark? Okay, today is kind of interesting because uh, we have the state of Texas is suing four states. I think it's Pennsylvania, Georgia, maybe Wisconsin, and one other, one other state, I, I don't remember. Michigan. What's that? Maybe Michigan. Yeah, maybe Michigan. Okay, so Texas is suing four states on an equal protection clause argument, which I think is very interesting because I've done some equal... I started out doing equal protection clause cases. So I really like the equal protection clause. And then they're also suing under due process, but no one can quite figure out what due process is. So I think you're better off. Something here. This is very unique, Mark, because this is one of the first times in our, that maybe you and I were paying attention. They brought the case directly to the Supreme well, it's got, but it's But it's got direct jurisdiction. because Yeah, it is direct jurisdiction. Well, what's interesting about the 14th Amendment, usually when I hear people talk about the 14th Amendment, they say, well, the 14th Amendment says this, and I look at the 14th Amendment, and I say, it doesn't say that, right? <laughs> it says, well, okay, all these guys are citizens, or everything applies everywhere, you know, like everything applies to businesses that applies to the government. And I, where's the words that say that? This one, actually, the words say, you know, you get equal protection. You know, you shall not be deprived of life, liberty, or property, you know, by the government, by any state government, right? And you get equal protection under the law. So the law, and then also, because each state has to treat everyone the same, then that means you got to treat, you know, the somebody in Georgia has the same rights as someone in Texas, and someone in Texas has the same rights as someone in Yeah, Georgia. but that's the heart of the argument, Mark. The, yeah, so I'm just, the heart, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, but I'm just saying, so you're getting deprived, so you've got this right to vote, and if you are in Texas, and you, and there's like, let's say, I don't know how many legal voters there are in Texas, but let's say there's whatever, 5 million legal voters in Texas, whatever there is, and so they, you get 5 million votes, and in Georgia, there's 5 million legal voters, but there's 5 million illegal voters. Well, Georgia got 10 million votes and Texas only got 5 million. So they got twice as many votes. So your right to vote has been diluted by half. So that's yeah, basically and, the argument. And what's interesting about that is the argument's a very, very complex argument. And they're saying because Texas handled the, the vote correctly, there is evidence that numerous states did not. And so there is the deprivation of your rights because the other states decided that it may be in Texas, as it said, that Trump won, but the other states have shown what appears to be massive voter fraud. And so that the people in Texas who voted for what they believe to be the rightful president has had the deprivation of a proper vote in those other states. Well, okay, I think that's a peripheral argument. I think what they're talking about, okay, so when you look at it, you know, I think it's Article 1, uh, Section 5 of the U.S. Constitution says that the legislatures are in charge of voting, the state legislature. Correct. The governor's not in charge, the Secretary of State's not in charge, the Supreme Court of that state's not in charge. And what happened from Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court changed the law. They said, oh, you can do mail-in votings without signatures, right? Yeah. Now, the legislature, Pennsylvania could have done that, but the legislature would have had to pass it, right? Right. Now, maybe if the governor vetoed it, it would still count because the legislature is in charge. But right. the Supreme Court can't do that, right? They just can't. Well, that's the same in every state you're referring to. There was yeah. some lowly, either the governor or the, the election. Uh, well, the secretary of state. The secretary of state. Or somebody or the just Supreme made Court. the law up and said, that's the way we're going to do it. Well, they ruled on it. Well, it, it ended up that way. But here's, and I think some of those states, and I think I think Pennsylvania is one of them. No, Georgia, I think is one of them. I'm not sure because I, I've been following several of these cases and things are happening pretty quickly and I've got my own business, <laughs> you know, so I can't follow everything. But my understanding is in at least some of these states, 
the state law constitution, I mean, the state constitution and the state law and the U.S. constitution all say the legislature is the, is the, is the sole power when it comes to how to run of elections. Right. And so they broke all three of those. They not only broke the U.S. constitution, uh, you know, Article 1, Section 4, they also broke their own constitution, whatever state, and they also brought, so broke their own state law. And then over in Texas, they didn't break the U.S. Constitution. They didn't break their state law and they didn't break their state constitution. So what they're saying, when you break all these things, we don't even have to prove fraud. We just have to prove that you violated the Constitution. Now, if you can run over there and violate the Constitution and we're following it, we're facing deprivation. So the advantage of this case is a de novo. They don't have to prove fraud. They don't have to prove a fraud. They have to prove that it was done incorrectly. All they have to prove is that this Supreme Court took the power away from the legislature and made a decision they weren't allowed to do. And since my Supreme Court didn't take that power from me, you guys had more freedom. I mean, we got deprived. So this is a de novo case. So I think this is a much better case than the other ones because what's going to happen in general, um, particularly with the powers that are struggling here. I mean, I think you have the CCP, you know, if you got the Communist Chinese Party on one side, um, you got the Trumpsters on the other side, um, you've got a puppet, I forget his name, but the, the kind of retarded guy. So you got the retarded puppet, and you got the CCP, and you've got the Trumpsters, and uh, they're going at it. And the CCP has no problem assassinating people. Like you have this guy, uh, uh, Harrison Dean, right? He's Governor Kemp's daughter's fiance. Yeah. Okay. Governor Kemp is under pressure from Trump to like, you know, audit this vote, audit this vote. He doesn't want to. And he says, okay, I'll audit the vote. And then the, this guy, this, uh, this Harrison Dean's driving to a Pence rally. His car just gets, you know, blown up. Right. They said it's a collision, but it's kind of a coincidence. Right. Yeah. And so then the governor was going to do a special legislative se uh, uh, session. But you've got to understand, this is the governor's daughter. She's traumatized. She's terrorized. Right. Yeah. So Kemp doesn't go to the Pence rally. He's a Republican. Why wouldn't he go to the Pence rally? They all back off. No, we're not going to have a legislative session. So you look at these people and of course, you've got the mafia, the, the KM, you've got this CCP and you've got the deep state, you've got the dirty FBI. All these guys do a lot of assassinations. And so they've kept in power for a long time by assassination. So that's the beauty of this de novo. You, you, it doesn't matter. You can't kill the witnesses, right? Right. I mean, it's just like it happened. It's all stipulated. You guys passed this law. It was in the newspapers on TV. CNN said it. MSNBC said it. The Washington Post said it. You can't take it back. Well, they'll try to take it back. In fact, I think YouTube wants to probably will censor this. So we'll have to cut off the other video because they say anything that says anything was wrong with the election, YouTube's going to not going to play. Well, that's because we're all fake news. Yeah, well, it's because <laughs> YouTube is part of the mafia, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Facebook, you know, YouTube, they all work for the source. They all work for source. So the okay, point of the matter is... Let's look at this a little bigger because the Supreme Court requested a briefing schedule. So they're taking it seriously. And I just heard before we came on, there okay. is a large number of states that are okay. doing amicus briefs. I think there's 14 states. Yeah, and because they, they all realize uh, what happened happened, and however the whatever I not this show is not about what the voter fraud or any of that. It's just talking about this one issue about the state of Texas, which, by the way, I believe it's Abbott that's the one that initiated this. I the Attorney General, I'm not sure. His yeah, name. and and because of this. This is going to be beyond some local yokel in the state's ability to say, oh, there's nothing there. Look the other way. There's nothing to see here. And that's what all these states are saying. All oh, yeah. their voter registrars and even the, the governors are saying, there's nothing here. Look the other way. But this is bigger than that. Well, I think what the what Governor Kemp said was like, we have to go to a funeral. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of out of the game. You know, and I mean, when you start killing politicians, kids, and if you listen to that IT lady who testified and she said, you know, they destroyed my life. They threatened me. They threatened my kids. I mean, this is the kind of people you're dealing with. These people yeah. are mobsters. 
and they'll kill anybody for a nickel. But of course, they're not killing for a nickel. Well, they're killing, I mean, they're they're killing for trillions of dollars, right? More than a nickel. Yeah, I'll say trillions. A tri they'll kill you for five <laughs> trillion, trillion, 20 trillion. But anyway, the point is, so here's a de novo case. You don't have to prove any facts. The facts are there. The question is, is it okay for some states to violate the U.S. Constitution, their own state constitution, and their own state law? Is that okay? Or is it not? If it isn't, that state, there's two ways you can go. You can either say, hey, Pennsylvania, your, your legislature can, the, 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 the electors that were selected through the improperly done election, right? Those don't count anymore. So you can either pick your own uh, electors, right? Now, if you've got 50, you know, if you, if you can't get that vote, then you can't pick them. So then it goes to Congress and then it goes to Congress and Congress decides the House of Representatives, not the whole Congress, not the Senate, for the president, it would be the House of Representatives. And people will go, well, the House of Representatives, Nancy's in charge, right? Because she hands out all the money and she's in charge of D'Alessandro. She's in charge of the heroin yeah. and the black market. And she's in got Chicago. hundreds oh. of billions of money to bribe people, right? I mean, you just walk down San Francisco Street, there's people with needles laying around and Nancy's going, oh man, open borders. We're selling so much heroin and methamphetamine this week. You know, and everyone's like, well, hey, on, let's forget about that. I don't okay, know but anyway, the point that. is, you the point is everyone about. goes, everybody in Congress is so bought off, so bought off that they're going to vote for Nancy's guy, right? Yeah. Whatever his name is, the guy with can't talk. And so, but it that doesn't work that way under the 12th Amendment. The, the, each state gets one vote and it has to vote on the composition of its legislature. And if you go on the 12th amendment, there's 27 states that are Republican and 22, I think it's 22 that are uh, Democrat, Democrats lose by the 12th amendment. So, you know, people are going, oh, you know, Nancy's got the house, she can bribe everybody. That's not gonna work. So basically assassinating people doesn't work and bribing people doesn't work, which is like, what are the Democrats gonna do? That's how they run their house, you know? Is by assassination of bribery. Well, I'm a, I I'm hoping that we don't revert to a banana republic, and I'm hoping there's no <laughs> more if there was assassinations, which I don't know for sure. But I think what we have to do is just follow the Supreme Court. Right now, the issue with that is we're hoping that none of those Supreme Court justices have an unfortunate accident. Uh, like Justice Scalia did in, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the hunting ranch where they, he died suddenly when he wasn't sick. And um, also he died when there was no federal marshals around no federal and he had no autopsy. And his, his, all his fluids were drained. And then he, they had him cremated immediately. And then the guy who pronounced him dead was 200 miles away on the phone. Right. So, yeah, oh, that he's was, dead? Yeah, yeah, he's dead. He's dead now. But I'm just saying, yeah. Well, you've also got like how many trips have some of these justices gone to Epstein Island? That matters a little bit too, because there's video trips on that. that. No, Maybe there's Justice there's, Roberts up to. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, you know, but sometimes you know when you're sometimes when you're hurrying and hurrying and hurrying, and you're thinking like, I got to get there at seven. Why? Because eight's too late. You know. But um, you know, that's how it works. Sometimes. But anyway, so so here's the deal. Okay, so now. Uh, the Supreme Court has put out, uh, once put out a briefing schedule for the- Three o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. So what's going to happen is, uh, the Supreme Court's been pretty active here. I would suggest they're going to take this up fairly quickly. They do have an army of interns that are going to be reviewing everything. So then the question comes in, what happens if all those states, uh, what you described about the 12th Amendment, is that's going to happen if you start eliminating the states? That I, I think that, um, I think if you I, lose one state, you know, if one state goes, it's the whole, the whole house of cards starts to crumble. Well, I got a question, though. Do you need to determine if one state's electors can't be seated? And you get then two states, three states, or whatever. Of all these four states, their electors can't be seated. Doesn't that just mean it subtracts the electors from whoever the state voted for? Well, you'd have to pick new, the, the legislature would pick new electors or Congress would have to pick them, okay? And if, so that's the way it goes. And all of these, for some, you know, just all these swing states are all Republican legislatures too. 
So the Democrats aren't going to win in the state houses and the Republicans will win in the Congress. So my question is, is this going to, could this lead to a revote in those states? Um, I don't think so. I think it'd be determinative. I mean, the reason that the Supreme Court heard this and threw out some other cases, because those weren't determinative. Those might have gone to one state or two states. But if you look at these four states, and if all four of these states lose those, I think it's 62 electoral votes, then um, Biden doesn't make it. Well, that's yeah, interesting because I believe Trump's around 230. Yeah, but I'm just saying if, if, he, if, if, if Biden loses, I think there's 62 or 65, whatever the number is of these four states, if you take that a number away from Biden, then Trump wins. Well, that's interesting because it, I'd have to this could that. lead to a lot. Of, this could lead to a bigger problem nationally with uh, all of a sudden the you know the rioters all of a sudden come. Well, back. I'll tell you in in San Francisco, I'm not going to mention any businesses' name, but they're barricaded up pretty good. I mean, I they're they're barricaded way better than they were before. So people are kind of looking for anti tank weapons, and you know before it was just machine gun fire and death in the street. Now it's like, this is really a demilitarized zone. So yeah, I well, think people are prepared I, I'm for hope, the well, This is a lot, because you did have 75 million people that believe that the vote's wrong. Right. Um, uh, or the results are read wrong. But uh, beyond that, I it's, it's kind of scary, Mark, thinking in our lifetime that we went from what was the golden state to what could be another, you know, Sandista revolution in the space like Portland <laughs> or Seattle. Sa San Francisco could be the next one on the hit parade. Well, I'm just saying that from what it looks like, I mean, just the way things are boarded up. And I think the survivors are the survivors. I mean, I lived in South America. And so a couple shootings a day, it's like, ah, you know, you get to your car, you're all right. Sometimes that bothers people, but I would say All right. this, well, listen, this, I will this say, is pretty democratic. I think it's time for us to uh, call it tonight. Uh -huh. I wanted to thank everyone for being here. And Mark, thanks for another stimulating conversation. And I will tell you, the uh, we'll have to watch for the next time to determine what really happened on November 3rd. Okay, Jim. Well, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun talking. And, and we'll see. It's up to the Supreme Court. And then after that, the dice are rolling, so we'll see okay. what happens. Okay, you take care. What happens, what happens in the United States, or if it's going to be the United States. Okay, okay. take care. Bye. Bye.